Good morning and welcome to January 30th, 2022, Hickory Plains Church of the Nazarene. We are honored that you have joined us. I want, before I get started, to give a little um, shout out to the program, The Chosen. If you have not watched this show, there's an app you can download on your phone and it's free. But it is the story of Jesus and his disciples, and it is amazing and life-changing. I have enjoyed it so much, and I would encourage you to spend some quality time watching this show, The Chosen. Before I get into my word this morning, I would like to have a word of prayer, so let us bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, once again, we just thank you for this moment in time. We don't understand very much of the eons of ages that you have designed, but we can trust your perfect design for us and your purpose in each moment of our lives. We praise you for that. But in so saying that, we also know that there is heartbreak and sickness and and wandering and we don't understand all things, but we pray that you will give clarity and love and comfort where it is due. Help us to be the church. Guide us and direct us. And as you are giving us greater resources, direct us as we use them to your glory for your love. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, I'm going to continue my series on the Here I Am statements. They're so important. It's difficult to state that something biblical is more important than something else, but the Bible must be taken and respected in all of its entirety. But there are some landmarks, some milestones that have marked time and direction relevant to our discipleship and growth, and that is why I'm speaking of these today. It can be argued that Moses is the most important figure in the history of the nation of Israel, the Hebrew people. Yes, we have fathers Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but the here I am at the burning bush marks a turning point for the oppressed people in anguish. God has heard their cry and he is preparing a way, the way that will be the hope of blessing for all mankind. It was this statement that began the great exodus, initiated the formation of the nation of Israel, and originated a religious consciousness with the receiving of the law. Moses was born at a time when the immigrant Hebrews were, out, were growing to outnumber the native Egyptians. Pharaoh had a solution, kill all the baby boys by throwing them into the Nile River. Moses' parents actually complied. They just arranged for him to float rather than sink and drown. He was found by a princess who hired his mother as a wet nurse, raised him in the palace, educated him well, and eventually this Hebrew-turned-Egyptian was assigned a high office in government where he commanded an army regimen. All this was great training for what God had planned. Moses was always the defender of the underdog, which caused him to be exiled from his palace home, and at the same time he was rejected by his own people. Fleeing Egypt for his life, Moses finds himself in Midian, where he sat down by a well. The daughters of Midian's priest came to water their flocks. Some shepherds drove them away, but again the advocate for the mistreated came to the rescue. As a result, Moses gained hearth and home. The loneliness and roughness of the wilderness developed sturdy qualities hard to find in a man matured in a palace. But we know God is creating a way, a custom-built man perfect for the job at hand. At the age of 80 years of age, the last thing Moses wanted to do was go back to the country where he was wanted for murder. If he had to go back, the last person he wanted to visit was Pharaoh, the king who could order him executed in a heartbeat. And if he had to go to Pharaoh, who thought himself a god, the last thing he wanted to do was tell Pharaoh that the real god said to release the Hebrew slaves used as cheap labor for pet projects. Moses was old and anonymous. He wanted things to stay that way. Staying the same, though, is never an option if you ask God to be part of your life. We know Moses never turned his back on his mother's teaching. If he had, he might have become a king himself. (coughs) Instead, he brooded his entire adult life over the maltreatment of his people and remembered the God of Abraham and his promises to those Hebrew people. Genesis 3, 1 through 4 tells the beginning of the long walk home, and I don't mean to Egypt. And I said Genesis, I meant Exodus, I'm sorry. 
Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames from fire, of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I'll go over there and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses, and Moses said, Here I am. God identifies himself, and the ground is holy. Then the Lord states his purpose in verses 7 through 8a. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Moses, the man obviously not afraid to jump into a fray, questions and argues. They won't believe me. They might think I'm speaking of one of the false gods of the Egyptian culture. God patiently answers, fills in some details, and firmly directs and assures Moses. Verses 3, 11 through 15. Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you, and this will be a sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. The Actually, the same place that Moses received his call is the same place that he received the law. Moses said to God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What that what <clears throat> what shall I tell them? I'm sorry, I'm stumbling over this scripture. God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. I know my sermon so far has sounded more like a child's Sunday school lesson, more than adult discourse, but as I continue, know this. God heard someone's cry, and through God's divine design, the respite, the beautiful supply and provision, came through a human voice answering, Here I am. Samuel answered God with a Here I am as a very young child. He was dedicated to God by his mother Hannah and raised in the house of the Lord. At the, his answer to call, he became God's messenger to Israel. If Samuel had had his way, there never would have been a king of Israel. God was their king, and he should singularly listen, and they should singularly listen and follow his ordinances and direction. However, Samuel was growing old, and his own sons showed no promise of wisdom and righteousness. So the people of Israel, rather than trusting God to their future, faithfully looking at the evidence of the past, decided to take matters into their own hands and ask Samuel for a king like all the other nations. Not without warning, Israel got their own way. They were advised a king would demand high taxes, sons would be drafted into the army, and daughters would be forced to serve in the palace, and land would be seized for the royal family. All of these things occurred, but in time of trouble, David returned to the faith of the prophets and the God who had proven faithful. My own here I am testimony began in the story of Isaiah. His story begins with a vision depicting the continued sinfulness of man, specifically the rebellious nation of Israel. A rebellious heart glorifies man at the expense of God. It amazes me how much we today repeat the spiritual failures of ancient Israel. When we are impressed by human glory, and we are, we begin to trust men and nations. As a result, our hearts are captured and destroyed by the very things we trusted. I remember one of my first understandings of God's place in my perspective of what was real and what was superficial. Keith and I were a young married couple. We wanted to go places, attend concerts, see NASCAR races, but I realized very quickly I was paying my hard-earned money to someone who could care less about me personally and do nothing for me. They couldn't heal my sin-sick soul. They certainly weren't going to cure any terminal illness I or mine might develop. They weren't paying off my student loans no matter what a good and faithful fan I ever proved to be. They just wanted me to continue to feed their pocket with my offerings for a few minutes we shared in space. Do I have some fun memories? Well, yes. And 
but does it equal the splendor of eternity? Absolutely not. My mother-in-law, Beverly, loved to travel, but life didn't give her the opportunities it has her boys. However, one summer, she and her husband, Alonzo, were able to make a trip north to the Badlands. They came within stopping distance of Mount Rushmore, and Beverly, my mother-in-law, refused to get out. I asked why. She said she would never pay a dime to gaze upon man's graven image. You might not agree with her, but think deeply on her commitment to God. She was not going to allow man into the space only God should occupy. I'm going to say that again. She was not going to allow man to occupy the space only God should. Thank you, Mother Beverly, for that outstanding lesson on holiness. She did not worship America and the men who made it great. She worshiped the God who had given her eternal life and the simple blessing of living in America. But how can the promise of holiness and blessedness replace rebellion and corruption? Let's look at Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin aton sins atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am, send me. To advance the gospel of Jesus Christ, to answer the call to the Great Commission, we must first abandon all entitlement to ourselves and see God correctly. What do the here I am answers matter? Jacob's story is a book ended by the... Uh, Jacob's story is bookended by the genealogies of Ishmael's descendants and the Edomites, the sons of Esau. The chosen are called so the non-chosen may know God's blessing. Twenty years prior to returning, Jacob left Canaan alone and empty-handed. He returned a tribal prince. The purpose of God is at work, not just through the extraordinary faithfulness of Abraham, but through the devious areas of self-interest and personal ambition. I want to return to Exodus, Exodus 3.14. God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God's answer to our questions will never be a pep talk. He will answer in this way. You are uniquely qualified by my divine will. You are up to the job for I will provide any resources including those you can't even imagine. But most importantly, I am with you always. Next week, I will continue this story, this study, with the event of Ananias ministering to the newly converted Saul. And you guessed it. He said, here I am. And just like Abraham, Jacob, Moses, and Samuel, the more God is with you, the more you will know how much you need him. And... The world needs us, needing and following Him. We are the chosen, and we have a job to do. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I just simply ask that you give us your vision, that we answer, here I am, and that you send us to bring your glory to the dark and lost world. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The Lord bless and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. You are loved. Have a great week.